Well, good morning again and welcome to Grace. We are excited that you are here. Let's just take a moment and welcome our newcomers to Grace this morning. If you would, join me in welcoming them. We are excited that you guys are here with us. Well, we're in the middle of a series and we're talking about our personal finances, which we- Why am I a cowboy? What am I wearing? Someone should have punched me in the face when I came out in that. Um, it's so bad. Well, I did have tan though. Look how tan I am. It's crazy. They don't want to be at. The beard, uh, uh, it just adds so much. It's gravitas. It's gravitas. And See, it's like Samson. Whenever he cut it, he spiritually was insignificant. And uh, <laughs> when, he let, when he let like it grow. In these days, when the shot was from a long way, you look like Voldemort. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> you, have, you have too much face. Thank you. <laughs> As I was talking to you uh, last week, it suddenly became aware to me, and, and mainly because Kelly told me, and, uh, um, which, by the way, my wife Kelly is the smartest person I've ever met. Um, it's really just not us, like what we turned into. No. You know, like what we started with is not what, <laughs> is no. Not what we turned into. No, I mean, it's, it, it, part of it's like embarrassing, and part it's of so it's like endearing, yeah. like oh, even watching like almost I'm just your own go children. With embarrassing. Yeah. But yeah, it, I, don't, I think that we spent so many years trying to figure out who we were, and um, it just took us a long time to really settle into who we were and what we, yeah. what we were supposed to be, yeah, and who God called us to be. And this is not it. Let's, this is definitely not it. With this thing, you know, with this thing pointing out of my eye. I would say that one of my earliest memories is um, my dad being super uh, violent with my mom. He was throwing plates around and he was threatening her. He was about to slap her. And I remember being probably, I don't know, maybe nine years old. And uh, I uh, stepped in between them and, and he pushed me down and my head hit the back of the counter. I remember uh, just feeling like really powerless. And uh, my dad was frequently physical. Um, one of the worst moments I remember um, was, and I don't even remember what age I was, but I remember him just being super angry with me and grabbing me by the throat, and slamming me against the wall and just choking me. And I remember just, I remember thinking like I, I could die. And um, yeah. One of the things I think that people would be surprised to know about my high school years is that I only went through my freshman year of high school into the beginning of my sophomore year, and then I dropped out of school. Um, I remember just that season of, of life was filled with, you know, drinking for me, um, just a lot of sadness, a lot of depression, filled with anxiety. I was at a party, a high school party, I've been dating this girl for about four years and she was fantastic. She was a wonderful person. And, uh, but she, well, we broke up that night. And I think for me, one of the things that was like tethering me to um, anything good was this relationship. And so when she broke up with me, it was really sad. And so I went out to the garage to be by myself. And, you know, I remember just being so angry. I took my keys and I threw them against the door, the garage door. And I was, you know, I didn't want to yell and be all weird with people there, but I felt just this real rage and, and frustration inside my heart. And that is when God spoke to me and said, I will never leave you and never forsake you. I had actually never heard those words before. And <laughs> to my surprise, later on reading the Bible, I found out that they were from the Bible. And I also understood, um, something very specific about what he was saying. I understood in that moment when he said, I will never leave you or forsake you, what he was saying to me was, um, uh, even, though, even though your family has fallen apart, even though you are by yourself, even though you feel lonely, even though everyone's let you down, I will never leave you and I will never let you down. Um, I think he gave me exactly what I needed as a 17 year old young man 
to commit my entire life to him. This is the house right here. That's the moment I consider myself to have become a Christian. In that one moment, God changed me. Um, not that everything changed in that moment, but most things changed. And the subsequent days and weeks and months were me learning a little bit more about Christianity at a very basic level. I was just kind of growing my, taking my first steps toward Jesus. And I still had no idea that I would go into ministry in any way, shape, or form. Um, at that point in time, I was still just trying to figure out what my next steps were going to be. But it wasn't long after that that uh, my youth pastor friend uh, came to me and said, I think God wants you to go to college. You're a smart guy. You need to go to college. And I'm thinking, college? Like, I'm a high school dropout. Nobody, you can't go to college when you're a high school dropout. And so he said, I want you to just go take the GED test and do that. And I took it, and I passed it, and got a GED. And it was an amazing experience. I mean, what God did for me after I became Christian, after he said there was more for me, is he put a desire for learning in my heart. And um, I still have that desire today. And if you know me at all, you know that I love to learn, but I love to learn things that actually make a difference in the world. I think I was either the first or one of the very first people ever admitted to Wheaton College with a GED. Um, I got my first set of grades and they were all like A's and B's. And, and I thought to myself, man, I never had A's and B's in my entire life. I must be really smart. When I first met him, I thought he was a geek. Uh, I don't know why I thought that. He introduced himself and said something or where he was from and I was like, what a loser. <laughs> but I think really soon after that, we became really good friends. Even as friends, all we did was talk. We talked about uh, books and we talked about theology and we talked about philosophy. So to find out that he was a high school dropout or to find out that that had always been part of his life was just so much more evidence to me of how powerfully Christ had changed him. When I left college, I was planning on going to medical school and uh, originally I wanted to be a surgeon, a thoracic surgeon, a heart surgeon. Uh, because again, God had put such a love for learning in my heart that I wanted to do the most complicated thing and the biggest thing. And so I was headed to uh, um, heart surgery. It seemed like something God wanted to do in his life. He had redeemed him from this person who cared nothing about education and nothing about school and kind of turned him into a person who was devoted to learning. I think along the way, God just would just like nudge us a little bit over to the right. Like the first nudge was he wasn't gonna be a surgeon, he was gonna be a psychiatrist. I just switched from surgery to psychiatry. I just went to seminary uh, in order to uh, get some theological background uh, for a medical practice because I didn't wanna just you know, dole out pills, right? I wanted to talk to people not just about their medical psychiatric problems or their emotional problems, but also their spiritual ones as well. As many of you know, this was my, not my idea at all to be a preacher. <laughs> uh, it's still weird sometimes to think about it. Um, but when I was younger, I was headed to medical school and I was at a church and just like you, I wanna be involved in the church that I'm a part of. And so my young wife and I, we were like, you know, what, what can we do in ministry? Uh, well, we were married for six months. Let's start a young marriage class, you know, cause we knew a lot about marriage. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, there we were and then we had 50 people show up and hundred people show up and 250, 250, 300 people showed up. And then the senior pastor of that church goes, hey man, have you ever considered being in ministry? And I said, no. And, uh, and I, then I went home and I was talking to uh, Kelly and I said, can you believe what the pastor said to me? And she goes, you know what? She says, I actually do believe that. Um, she says, I think you do have ministry gifts and I'd love to explore that. We were saying yes to God more than we were saying yes to ministry. It didn't feel like the inevitable thing. It felt like the right thing. And I remember even the moment when I was being ordained, there was a thousand people in the room. I've got these 10 elders and their hands are on my shoulders and I'm kneeling down before the entire congregation. And I'm just sitting there thinking, I'm not 100% sure that this is what I'm supposed to do in my life. And I'm thinking, God, this is a big, giant deal. I think taking the job at Northland for Mike was probably the biggest sacrifice he's ever made. I think it was cool and everybody thought it was such a great opportunity. And even he thought it was awesome and we loved the church and he loved what he was gonna be doing in a way. But it really felt kind of like walking up to the altar and like putting a stake in some really long held dreams that were really important to him. He had a vision for his life, and to lay that down to follow God was one of the most 
humbling, difficult, and also, I think, inspiring for me, things that he's ever done. I became pastor of uh, pastoral care, and then I would preach once a month, all seven services. We had seven services and about 7,000 people at that time. Mike came off the stage the first time he delivered a sermon and told me that he felt like God was smiling at him. And he told me that he never wanted to go back to a life where he wasn't teaching God's word to people. 19 years ago, I was fired from a ministry job and it was hard. And like you, um, I, I had a really bad encounter with the church. Now, when I became a Christian, God changed my life radically. So I knew that if I was ever going to be a mature Christian, if I was ever gonna grow in Christ, I always needed to be attached to the church. But it was the first time that I thought to myself, the church is terrible and I don't wanna be part of it. I was scared and mad and really hurt from the church. And the last thing I wanted to do was run to the thing that had hurt me. We were just devastated and we didn't know any path ahead. And on one hand, we were so anxious and worried about that. On the other hand, we felt like we were young and had the opportunity to kind of do anything. We ultimately came to the decision that leaving ministry for us would be disobedience. It wasn't an option. Um, it didn't feel good. Uh, we didn't run, want to run back to any church. Uh, we didn't know what that looked like. We didn't even know what type of job Mike would want. But I feel like we thought it was less than what God wanted for us if we walked away. It probably took me maybe, I don't know, three or four weeks after that initial conversation to just get my heart at a place where I was like, I'll consider this now. All of a sudden, the Lord showed up in powerful and strange ways. Literally, people would ring our doorbell and run away. And, and not the bad kind of thing, but we would open it and on the chair that's right next to our door, it's still there. And it was sitting there and there'd be like this envelope and there would just be fat stacks of cash inside of it. I don't know. I was like, well, this is a delight, you know? And uh, I was like, this is fantastic. What's happening here? And there would be notes inside of it saying, we're praying for you. We love you. And God's not done with you. God is not done with you. I guess the one thing that I never really wavered in was my relationship with God. That's not something that's ever, in my mind, since I became a Christian, been challenged. And I think the reason for that is because I came from a background that was like totally irreligious. And so I have a real sense in my own heart of what it's like to walk without God in life. And at least for me, it was horrible. I had only the resources that I have in my own brain to be able to solve my own problems, and it was a mess. What I wavered about was, in what way, God, are you going to use me? And I think that's, I think that's where a lot of people are, actually. I mean, <laughs> trying to figure out, like, what is my purpose and how does that connect to my relationship with God? Just for me, the relationship with God thing never wavered. I was absolutely certain about Jesus. We weren't planning on starting a church. We, I mean, think about yourself, starting a church? Like, that's, okay, I could do a franchise. I can do a business. I could be a therapist, I could be a doc. Let's start a church. No, that's not something that normal people think. So when we decided to actually start the church, um, it, it was fast. I mean, from the time we decided to do it to the time the church had its first service, nine weeks, we just opened the doors. There just seemed to be a lot of buzz and excitement about us moving into the heart of the community in the school. The next week was devastating. For Kelly and I, that was one of the lowest points in all of Grace's history. 